any digital artifact can be duplicated. Well, actually that was true until 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin. Bitcoin is scarcity in digital realm. It's the digital equivalent of gold. If you think for a moment about the crucial role of physical gold in the history of our civilization, money and finance, you can appreciate how disruptive could be the digital equivalent of gold in our digital civilization and the future of money and finance. Well, Bitcoin is what happens when you put money uh, on the internet and you can transmit it the same way you can transmit an email. So what Bitcoin does uh, to money and banking is what email did to the post office and fax machines. Bitcoin is a decentralized, unstoppable type of internet money that's not controlled by any government, bank or company. The end goal for Bitcoin has got to be um, world reserve currency. A world reserve currency that's managed by the people, for the people, um, not by any government um, that will be used everywhere in the world, but not necessarily by everyone all of the time. Uh, it will provide a global standard of value. I discovered Bitcoin at the end of 2010 because of a Slashdot article. But when I visited the website, it looked familiar and I, I'm sure I saw it before, actually. Um, the thing is, uh, I've always been interested in this idea of cryptocurrency. So I might have actually seen this uh, website earlier than that. And uh, I didn't stay on the website. I, I kind of uh, just uh, briefly, maybe, I spent 10 seconds on it. But then when I saw this Slashdot article, I went there again and I downloaded the, the Satoshi white paper and I started to read it and I became obsessed with it. Actually, I couldn't sleep when I, when I read that paper for the first time. Uh, I was trying to understand it and uh, it, uh, it took all my attention and then I, I started uh, to, to read it again, I couldn't understand, I couldn't sleep. One of my goals was, was to, to uh, create a, a cryptocurrency. Um, but I did not solve the, the, the double spend problem. So I, when I found this paper, it was like somebody found a solution to a problem that I had before, and I wanted to understand it. In the end, it took me a lot of time, three days to, to really read this paper may have had the first uh, public email from Satoshi, I'm not sure. Um, I thought it was interesting and sent him a reference to Weidai's paper called B Money, which was another proposal using Hashcash to uh, make a respendable coin. So it was proposed in 1998 and Nick Zabo had proposed a similar idea called Bitgold, but both of those proposals were sort of outline proposals without full implementation details and without being implemented. I noticed that his paper didn't uh, reference this also and I sent him a reference to it. So I think he went and uh, talked with Weidai and that's how the B Money reference was added to the paper. Going back to the experiment of bootstrapping value, so with Digicash, they, even though they didn't get to market with uh, live bank integration, they released a beta server and they promised that they would never issue more than a million of these beta buck demo coins. And so, and, they, and you could send them an email and they would send you a few coins. And so uh, a number of people on the cypherpunks list got interested to see if they could bootstrap value. So they would sell different sort of low value items for these beta bucks, so t-shirts and things like that. So, um, Unfortunately, the, the experiment didn't run its course. The company went bankrupt and you could no longer spend the coins because the central database was offline at that point. When I saw Bitcoin, it did you know, connect in my mind that there was a previous experiment that was centralized that tried to do bootstrap value. So maybe Bitcoin could also bootstrap value in the same way. But it, I mean, it took a number of years until the, there were exchanges, until the price became a bit more stable. When I was in high school, I was interested in something called the Freenet Project, which was 
essentially anonymous, decentralized, censorship-resistant publication. You know, essentially the idea being if you want to go publish something like a website, you can do this and it's very difficult to take down. But, I mean, my dad was an economist, I was always interested in economics, and I thought, well, what use is you know, decentralized censorship-resistant publication if I don't also have decentralized censorship-resistant money? So I got interested in that as well as part of the Freenet project. And sure enough, I wound up uh, exchanging emails with Adam Back and Hal Finney and some other initial people. But, you know, did I go and say, contribute to the design of Bitcoin? I mean, I might have helped to rule out some things, but uh, that's all on Satoshi. And I'll admit, you know, when I heard about Bitcoin much later, my first reaction was, you know, I should have thought of that. Because it's such a beautiful, simple system. Uh, it, it's not code that's changing the network, it's people changing the network, okay? And Bitcoin has a huge stable of good developers that are working on it constantly. And that makes Bitcoin better. People have more confidence that Bitcoin can handle various attacks against it. When I first got into Bitcoin, when I really started to learn about it, um, I was immediately attracted to the more political aspects of it and the social aspects of it. It's this new kind of money, but who controls this money? Who, who pushes the buttons and what's going on there? So I started to focus on that. And that became kind of a topic down the road uh, with the scaling debate and all that. Um, but the thing is, I, I started to realize that in Bitcoin, the two are very interwoven. You have the politics of the system and they're very interwoven, interwoven with the technology itself. The technology is a tool for the politics of what's going on and who gets to control and uh, which turns out to be users actually more than anyone else. Um, so in order to understand the politics I had to understand technology and in order to explain the politics and the political dynamics and the social dynamics of the system I had to actually be able to explain the technology behind the system. So that's how I veered into really understanding the technology and starting to really explain the technology. And over time, people have turned to come to see me as a technical writer, which I have become, but it's, it came from my political interest in the system. Bitcoin appears hard to understand because it combines elements of cryptography networking and data transmission, game theory, economic and monetary theory. It is a decentralized digital currency not made by any government or organization that allows instantaneous peer-to-peer -peer transaction with negligible transaction cost being based on the security provided by cryptography and synergic economic incentive. Bitcoin is decentralized and this is all crucial, but this is also cross-border, cross-jurisdictional, transnational and resilient to any kind of network attack. You know, some people when they saw it existed, they were like, whoa, this is what I've been waiting on. So uh, beyond the technical aspects, I think that there's still, you know, a ton of to learn about it. There's a ton to do research on. And because it's such a, um, you know, such a, like a diverse system, there's many, many layers in Bitcoin. You know, there's kind of like uh, the base layer, the technical layer, then there's kind of like a social layer, economic layer, uh, you know, sociolo sociology, kind of like how do human beings coordinate, you know, in these like far flung regions of the world. And I think, uh, you know, it just shows the amazing quality of the internet, right? That there are many Bitcoin developers, like, you know, a week ago, like I was in a room, some people had never met for the first, they met for the first time there in that particular room. Yet they've been working together online for years without even like seeing their own face because uh, they, you know, kind of had the spirit of Bitcoin that they were all moving towards. It didn't really matter, you know, which country they were in or, you know, how much they understood a particular part of it. I think uh, it's kind of like basically like a new nation uh, in a sense, uh, which is pretty cool. I would like to see more of an ecosystem develop that's more similar to the way that, say, like the World Wide Web developed, where uh, most web developers don't need to know much about, you know, t writing TCP IP stacks and configuring routers and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, they can focus more on um, authoring content, uh, or in this case, it would be more like integrating with services 
that exist already, um, or maybe you know creating new services or new new use cases for this that uh, that, that, that were not possible, uh, especially. Things like uh, you know instant micropayments, uh, you know a lot of machine-to-machine -machine payment type of things that are not really uh, viable with, with current payment rails. Uh, we could have a programming model that would allow more developers to come in and and work, uh, and, you know, become productive very quickly without the need to delve all the way down to the lowest internals of the protocol. The internet is a hostile place. Anyone um, can be themselves on the internet behind the mask of anonymity and that leads to people being very honest or very dishonest or acting however they feel like. Uh, at the same time, Bitcoin is a very important technology or at least it has the potential to be a very important techno uh, technology with lots of interest groups acting upon it. Um, Everyone has, its, has their own vision for Bitcoin. Uh, there are competing um, cultures that are all acting on this system. Everyone wants to change it to their benefit. Or, um, and there's no, um, there is no clean governance process. It is, this is how it works, this is how it's formed. It's anarchy online and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the money of anarchy. So what do you expect? It's, People are gonna fight over it in any way they can, um, but it works. Well, you, you know, when people talk about Bitcoin's cryptography and being proven by the test of time, Bitcoin's cryptography itself, the actual cryptographic algorithm it uses, it's essentially guaranteed that they would go work. What is new in Bitcoin is the social incentives, the way the whole system pays for proof of work and also the way Bitcoin resists change by external actors. So I think, if anything, the hard fork attempts that we are seeing, which keep failing over and over and over again, they go show that the governance of Bitcoin works and that the governance is resistant to small groups of people trying to change Bitcoin. The Bitcoin protocol and the system as a whole is governed by rules that are mathematical in nature. And these rules are written in software in every single copy uh, running on every single computer that participates in the Bitcoin network. Every computer has a copy of the rules and has to follow them exactly. Um, and it's through the participation of all of these nodes that uh, you have security. But no one actually is in charge. No one has a rule of authority. Uh, one way to put it is that Bitcoin is a system of rules without rulers. And that's a unique phenomenon. But there are some parallels to the idea uh, of the internet itself, where uh, people understand that there are many companies that operate on the internet and collaborate to make the internet work, but no one owns the internet and no one is in charge of the internet as a whole. There have been a number of technologies with the internet which have shown people that technology can change uh, the balance of power between the individual and governments. So an example of that from older history was the printing press, but more recently the internet itself. And uh, beyond that, for example, PGP in the early 90s, um, I, I became aware of that, quite interested in the implications of encryption that uh, the individual could have uh, the ability to exchange messages that even a government couldn't decrypt. So. Um, as part of that, people then thought about other, other rights. So in the physical world, you have uh, some rights to privacy that are implied or in laws. And you also have freedom of association and privacy rights. I actually think governance is working very well. When you have a store of value, one of the properties that you look for is durability. And that means that it doesn't change very often. And the governance so far has shown that it is extremely hard to change Bitcoin to whatever it is that you want. And Bitcoin has sort of resistance in that way. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net. 
without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country. Your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Several currency exchanges exist where you can buy and sell bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. Your bitcoins are kept in your digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. Sending bitcoins is as simple as sending an email. And you can purchase anything with bitcoin. The bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners. Miners are rewarded newly generated bitcoins for verifying transactions. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger. Bitcoin opens up a whole new platform for innovation. The software is completely open source and anyone can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Bitcoins are a great way for businesses to minimize transaction fees. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them and it's easy to set up. There are no chargebacks and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. Bitcoin operates as a peer-to-peer -peer network and what that means is that architecturally it's flat. Uh, everyone operates on an equal basis. There are no special computers, there are no central servers. It's a loose collaboration between um, thousands and thousands of computers that all operate on an equal basis and don't trust each other. They verify everything on their own to follow the Bitcoin protocol. To transfer value using digital means has been possible for decades, but we have always been relying on a central authority to avoid, let's say, Alice, to transfer twice the digital artifact representing her own wealth to, let's say, Bob and Carol. How is this achieved in Bitcoin without a central authority? Well, all Bitcoin network nodes, they do validate all transactions. But those nodes also providing the computational power to finalize them, those nodes are called mining nodes. Miners compete among themselves in order to be the first one to finalize a block of transactions. Yes, transactions are validated in blocks, not one by one because the miner, being the first one to do that, is rewarded with the issuance of new Bitcoin as a special transaction included in that same block. Now, this is an incentive for the miner to be honest, because if the miner was to include an invalid transaction in the block, the block will be rejected as invalid by all other network nodes, and with that rejection, also the reward will be invalidated as it never exists. So miners, they do have an economic incentive, to be honest, and doing that, they do solve the double spending problem. I, I would be very happy if Bitcoin could um, either replace banks or force banks to, to change the way they work because it provides an alternative. Uh, it gives people uh, a way to uh, avoid the banking system and the debt system. That's what I believe in. Data can be transferred with zero marginal cost. Nonetheless, if you want to transfer the few bytes representing your own wealth, you have to pay a fee, you have to do that 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, and it takes two or more days to reach the recipient. Ten years down the road, we will look back at this and it will all seem funny. The question is not if, but who and when will gift humanity of a transactional network of peer-to-peer -peer transaction with affordable network fees. And this is Bitcoin. Well, some of the nodes are connected to very large computing facilities that are almost like the industrial infrastructure of Bitcoin and they provide security. And the way they provide security is by validating every transaction and sequencing it in order to put it into the blockchain ledger. Now, in the process of doing that, they must commit as a guarantee uh, an amount of energy and uh, that protects the network from anyone cheating. Having keys is a huge responsibility and you want to be able to recover your money if you lose your device. 
So we want to, we want to onboard users very easily. Um, basically the process would be, okay, you have your hardware wallet, you can connect it uh, without installing anything to your web browser or to your phone. You will get prompted to create your account, which is your online identity for Bitcoin. You will write down those, this identity so that if you are able to recover, if you lose the device, which is very important. And from there, you would deal with your Bitcoin wallet like you would do with, uh, with your PayPal account typically. So you wouldn't see the complexity of handling uh, Bitcoin, but you would be transacting in a fully, um, fully pseudo-anonymous and fully censorship-resistant way. Whatever the computational power of Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin protocol adapts the difficulty of the mining puzzle of the problem that the miner have to solve to finalize a block in order to have one block every about 10 minutes. This is all relevant because it completely specifies the Bitcoin monetary policy. The amount of Bitcoin generated at the beginning, it was 50 Bitcoins per block but it is halving every four years so that it will stop completely generating new Bitcoin at about 2140. This is mimic the progressive scarcity of gold extraction. That's why mining is called that way. So Bitcoin is an asset. That is, it is not a liability, it's not a promise. It's a bearer asset. If you lose the private key controlling your Bitcoins, your Bitcoins are lost. It is scarce in digital realm as nothing else before. It can be transferred but not duplicated. That is, it can be spent but not double spent. Its monetary policy mimics the one of physical gold. The conclusion is clear. Bitcoin is, or at least wants to be, the digital equivalent of gold. This is the major breakthrough by Satoshi Nakamoto. So that I think that the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. The one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. The way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you, and there's no record of where it came from. And you, you may get that without knowing who I am. That kind of thing will develop on the Internet, and that will make it even easier for people to use the Internet. Of course, it has its negative side. It means that uh, the gangsters, the people who are engaged in illegal transactions, will also have an easier way to carry on their business. But I think that the a tendency to make it harder to collect taxes will be a very important positive effect of the internet. Sound money is important because it can't be taken away from you and it encourages saving, it encourages all sorts of virtue and it, it will make you a better person by doing it. Uh, our tendency is to spend as much as we can, to not save and sort of let tomorrow be whatever. Uh, if you plan for the future and you pursue goals, that will be a very good thing in your life because you will have accomplished something that makes the world better. And this is hard to, to really understand or think about in the United States or in the EU or in countries where we have stable currencies. But you need to think about it like this. Bitcoin is neutral. It doesn't care what you do, who you are. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're doing well, if you're not doing well. And it's essentially the, the best store of value that we've ever had. It's incredibly scarce. Um, and it's not controlled by, by any central entity, very similar to gold. Um, however, in comparison to gold, it's a lot easier to store and it's a lot easier to transact with. You imagine trying to go to the corner store and buy something for 10 euros with gold, right? You take your gold bar and you shave off your little gold and you weigh it and then you uh, agree on, on this being the correct amount of gold. Or you just bring your phone, you tap somewhere, and you pay. Not technical people should pay attention to Bitcoin because, uh, well, it's 
quite important to consider money as something that you own and as something that you can always use. Uh, today, the biggest difference between Bitcoin and other methods of transferring assets is that nobody can block you from transferring Bitcoin. Today, if you have a PayPal account, uh, PayPal can decide for whatever reason to freeze your funds or can decide that you are not uh, able to process a transaction just because they, they decided to close down or because they have a technical problem. With Bitcoin, you can always find a way to send your assets if anything, I mean, if anything happens, even on your connection or on your local wallet, you can recover, you can find multiple solutions, everything is interoperable and you keep ownership and control over your assets all the time. There are already a lot of other payment systems that exist uh, that it's hard to compete with if you're just looking for a cheap and fast payment system. So uh, we, Bitcoin really needs to provide a new uh, angle to this whole thing. It needs, it needs to have a value proposition which is unique. I don't believe that we should ever have a good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. We can't take them violently out of the hands of government, all they can do is, by some sly roundabout way, <laughs> introduce something they can't stop. Frederick August von Hayek, Economic Nobel Prize, has been complaining as to why we consider the government monopoly of money as necessary. Well, Bitcoin innovates on just that. It's that kind of permissionless innovation characteristic of email, which has not been designed by a consortium of postal office, which is internet, not designed by a consortium of telcos. Why do we expect that the next transactional network for value should be designed by banks? I think the nature of money changes over time, especially in this particular case, as this technology evolves. So uh, Bitcoin can be digital gold and electronic cash. Those are simply different steps in the maturity of the technology. The parallel between physical gold and digital gold can be pushed further. Gold has been recognized by all civilization without central planning. It has been used for centuries as money. It has bootstrapped all monetary system we know of. It has been surpassed by more advanced form of money without becoming obsolete. This is exactly what is happening to Bitcoin and what will happen to Bitcoin in the near future. Of course, as happened to gold, Bitcoin is not exactly loved. Let's remember, 1933, the possession of physical gold was forbidden in the US. 1972, the convertibility of the US dollar in gold was forbidden again. Well, this is probably the same kind of attitude that Bitcoin will see, but in this case, since this gold is much lighter, faster, more secure, it will be quite hard to corner it and dismiss it. I think throughout history we see that new technologies are misunderstood at first, uh, underestimated on a massive basis, especially by incumbent industries. Uh, look at how uh, newspapers were affected by the internet or the music business or the movie business. Um, TV uh, stations uh, and increasingly government and healthcare. Uh, every industry that faces disruptive change uh, at first thinks that this is not really that big a deal. Uh, and then very quickly the tide turns. I think that banking is no different than any of the other uh, industries. And the fact that it hasn't been affected by internet and digitization technology yet um, had a lot to do with the uh, cartel-like, anti-competitive and regulated behavior of that market. And now the banking industry is facing the internet and the banking industry will lose. If the security is, is too difficult to use, then users don't use it and in, in the end it also harms the usability. So I'm trying to do things that are simple. I'm really excited about uh, multi-layer solutions, and I think that this is just the way that you scale networks. The internet scaled this way, um, where you don't need to have every single transaction um, checked by everyone. So only the transactions that uh, are in dispute really are, are, are necessary. I mean, as long as, uh, say, you have two parties that are transacting, 
if uh, you know if it's a consensual uh, trade uh, and, and both parties walk out happy, right? Nobody else really needs to know about that. So there have been some interesting improvement done in the protocol itself in the future in the future versions uh, that will be coming in the that will be arriving in the coming years. Even uh, scalability solutions like Lightning uh, will help on the fungibility as well. And there are some extremely interesting development done on the on the on the Mimble Wimble protocol today. So which uh, which basically hits all the birds with one stone. So with one protocol change, you manage to have something which scales better because the blockchain is uh, able to self amend and to to basically destroy the old transactions that are not used anymore. Uh, you are more fungible because you manage to, you can hide more information about the transactions, and in the end, so yeah, I think we will see some improvement in the in the years to come into this very fundamental aspect that in the end will just move Bitcoin back to its uh, original root, which has, in my opinion, um, mostly anti-censorship resistance. Mimble Wimble may well be the most promising technology out there. Uh, so it solves some of Bitcoin's biggest problems, which are scalability and fungibility at once. Um, but it would probably have to be deployed as a sidechain just for the sake of keeping Bitcoin going. If it would be a new altcoin, you have the problem where it undermines the trust in the, in the Bitcoin system and therefore also in the Mimble Wimble system, because who knows what comes after that and after that. I think that you know, in the future, I think developers will find it a little bit easier to kind of build directly on top of Lightning rather than Bitcoin proper, because uh, you know, Bitcoin proper um, can get kind of complex with like transactions, the signing, the inputs, and everything like that. While with Lightning, it's kind of like a simpler API, as in you know, you open a channel, and they have that concept of kind of like a channel being like a like a tube of money that you can like kind of like swish around, and then you can basically just pay via that channel. And I think we'll see a lot of cool innovation in this because now people can do really what they wanted to do initially. And uh, you know, I think we'll continue to kind of progress Bitcoin like this and you know, add more and more abstractions on top of uh, the base layer because this is how you know, technology is fundamentally built, right? You start with some base layer of technology and uh, you know, as, you go, as you add more techniques to it, you add more and more abstraction and then it gets farther away from the base layer. But at that point, you know, it's a little more flexible and maybe people won't even know that there's actually this base layer that's going on there. So. So it makes it possible then to participate in Bitcoin and send transactions globally. So what, I mean, what we've deployed is the ability to receive the Bitcoin blockchain, so the stream of blocks um, from the satellite, and that reduces the cost of participating in the Bitcoin network. So today to run a full node, so a node that's receiving all the transactions and is validating them, which is the most, sort of, which provides you the best security, you need to receive quite a lot of data, gigabytes per month. By broadcasting, we reduce the cost of um, running a full node. It's also possible, you know, that, that just broadcasts the transactions to you so that you can validate everybody's transactions. And if you want to transact yourself, you still have to send your transaction. I still believe that there's a lot, of, a lot more growth to go. Um, I'm not sure if it'll reach the moon necessarily, but the network effect is still there. The anti-fragility is still there. I believe that the whole ecosystem continues to grow and very few people still own Bitcoin.